Hi, my name is Arielle Keller and I'm a graduate student in neurosciences at Stanford University. Uh, I'm excited to share my research with you today. This work was really driven by a strong desire to unpack this overloaded term of concentration difficulties and to really parse what attention impairments in psychiatric illness are and what they look like in the brain using an RDOC inspired approach. So first, let's think about what attention really does for us. There's really an overload of sensory information coming into our brains at all times, but we only actually consciously experience a tiny portion of it. Attention acts as this essential filter or gatekeeper that keeps our minds protected from sensory overload and allows us to selectively process the most important information for meeting our goals. Because attention plays this important role, it really affects many attributes of our day-to-day -day experiences. Beyond controlling what we perceive, Attention can also affect how we feel and our emotional states can in turn influence where and how we pay attention. Attention also influences what we remember and how we make decisions, which again can play a role in how we allocate attention. Since attention is so important for all of these aspects of our experience, it's important that we understand how attention changes in the context of mental illness. So concentration difficulties are a diagnostic criterion for many psychiatric disorders, including major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and others. In spite of their association with worse daily functioning and poorer clinical outcomes, we still lack a complete understanding of what concentration difficulties really are and how they're manifested in the brain. When I began graduate school four years ago, I was surprised to find that there was no gold standard behavioral task for measuring concentration difficulties objectively in the laboratory nor did we have detailed self-report assessments for really capturing patients' lived experiences with concentration difficulty. Prior literature on attention and depression and anxiety has primarily focused on understanding negative biases. So when subjects are presented with positive or negative images like happy and sad faces, depressed participants tend to linger their attention longer on sad faces than uh, while anxious participants tend to orient their attention faster to those negative images. While this line of research has yielded really important insights into how depressed and anxious patients sample information from their environments in a biased manner, these findings don't really capture the lived experiences of people who describe having concentration difficulties in work or school. Uh, so the main questions that I'll answer today are first, what are concentration difficulties really? And second, what do they look like in the brain? Inherent to these questions is the necessity of linking across multiple units of analysis. This approach, inspired by the research domain criteria, or RDOC framework, will allow us to characterize concentration difficulties as a transdiagnostic symptom dimension with correlates at the self-report, behavioral, physiological, and circuit levels. In a first exploration of these ideas, I leveraged data from the International Study to Predict Optimized Treatment for Depression, or ISPOT-D. This is a data set with over a thousand depressed participants and pretty thorough behavioral characterization. So I identified a subgroup of individuals who I exhibited far worse at selective attention performance than a normalization sample of 336 healthy controls. In line with our a priori hypotheses about the circuit and physiological correlates of this behavioral impairment, this subgroup of inattention participants showed hypoconnectivity of the frontoparietal attention network without showing impairment on other large scale neural networks. They also showed lower posterior alpha power in the EEG when comparing an eyes closed rest condition to an eyes open rest condition. For the project that I'll tell you about today, I had two main goals. First, I wanted to identify the mechanisms supporting goal-directed attention. And to meet this goal, we would need computational tools that help isolate top-down or goal-directed attention from stimulus-driven attention, as well as tasks specifically designed to probe subtypes of goal-directed attention. Second, I wanted to explore how goal-directed attention changes in the context of mental illness. And for this, we would need to recruit participants transdiagnostically. When you think about it, there are so many ways that our brains can pay attention to things. So if you imagine you're entering your kitchen in the morning and you wanna make yourself a cup of coffee, you first need to locate a mug to put it in. By employing spatial selective attention, you can focus on one location of space while ignoring irrelevant locations in order to meet your goal. Upon opening the cabinet, you'll need to identify mug-shaped objects among other irrelevant objects for which you'll employ feature selective attention. As you're drinking your coffee, or sorry, as you're making your coffee, you might find yourself multitasking, perhaps taking a call at the same time, so your attention will be divided between two tasks. Finally, while you make your coffee, you may simultaneously be monitoring the toaster for when your breakfast is ready, and thus dividing your attention among two sources of information. Inspired by these everyday scenarios, I utilize the following set of behavioral tasks. 
to assess feature selective attention, I presented subjects with overlaid images from two different object categories and cued them to attend just one category at a time in order to detect an upside down stimulus in that attended category. The object categories included faces, bodies, cars, houses, and pseudo words, and were presented in trials of eight images at a time over eight seconds as shown in this example trial. To assess spatial selective attention, I presented images on both sides of the screen and cued subjects to, to identify upside down faces on either the left or the right, depending on where they're cued, and ignore upside down images on the opposite uncued side. To assess divided attention among tasks, I presented a single stream of images, either on the left or the right, and instructed subjects to respond with one type of button press when they detected an upside down image, and another type of button press when they detected a scrambled image. To assess divided attention among sources, I presented two simultaneous streams of information and cued subjects to attend both sources in order to detect a scrambled image that could occur on either side. So for this study, we recruited 58 participants and this included healthy controls as well as um, patients recruited transdiagnostically. Uh, participants performed the four attention tasks that I just described, as well as an oddball and a working memory task using the same stimuli during both fMRI scanning and also during EEG recording. These were done separately. Um, and they provided self-report through surveys of their attention and other symptoms. Okay, so be comparing behavioral performance on the four attention tasks to the subject's reported concentration difficulties, I found that the feature-based selective attention task was the most significantly associated with higher self-reported concentration difficulties. So for this reason, I'll now focus on this particular subtype of goal-directed attention and come back to the others just at the very end. Interestingly, performance on this particular task was also associated with higher frequency of early life stressors in patients, suggesting that stress may have an impact on the susceptibility to attention impairments and mental illness. To disentangle top-down goal-directed attention from bottom-up stimulus-driven attention, I utilized complementary computational approaches in both the fMRI and the EEG. In both cases, my goal was really to separate the ongoing activity that we associate with top-down attention from activity that's time-locked to stimulus presentation, which we associate with bottom-up attention. In the fMRI, I started by taking the time series that we recorded and I used a standard GLM approach to remove the predicted hemodynamic response at each stimulus presentation. Rather than discard the residuals from this model, I retained the residual activity, which in principle should represent more of that top-down ongoing neural activity once the stimulus-driven activations are removed. In the EEG, I used a similar approach, starting with the, the usual time series depicted here as a time frequency transform with time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. I subtracted out the event-related potential, or ERP, which contains the average activity time-locked to stimulus onset, leaving me with the ongoing activity. In this particular example taken from my master's thesis, you can see that the theta oscillations at four to seven hertz are time-locked to stimulus presentation indicated by that dotted line in the top plot, whereas alpha oscillations at eight to 13 hertz are ongoing and not time-locked to the stimulus in this experiment, as you can see in the bottom plot. In the case of the fMRI, I had the additional advantage of choosing stimulus categories that had distinct areas for specialized processing in the brain. So working within each subject's individual brain, I mapped their face selective, body selective, house selective, and word selective regions in the ventral temporal cortex, shown here, using data from a separate functional localizer. After computing the residuals with the technique that I just described, I extracted those residuals from each subject's category selective region, as well as from areas of the frontoparietal network defined by the Glasser Atlas. I then computed the correlation between these two, which I'll refer to as residual correlations. Others have referred to the same phenomenon as background connectivity or intrinsic connectivity. Um, these are the frontal and parietal regions I'll be focusing on in the next slide. I observed that there was a strong relationship between the residual correlations and behavior on the feature selective attention task using a linear mixed effects model to account for the fact that I've sampled multiple times from each participant for each of the object categories. Here, the correlations and residual activity between these frontal and parietal regions and the category selective regions in the VTC are associated with performance on each of these categories specifically. So to break that down a little bit and reframe it, um, for example, the reaction time to upside down faces is associated with residual correlations between the frontoparietal network and that subject's face selective region. 
interestingly, when I use the regular time series rather than the residuals, this effect goes completely away. In the EEG, I observe a similar phenomenon, namely that the residual alpha power is associated with feature selective attention reaction times, but this effect is not observed when I use the EEG time series. These findings reveal distinct circuit and physiological correlates of concentration difficulties measured objectively, which depend on this computational technique to separate the top down from the bottom up signals. With our divided attention tasks, we find that frontoparietal residual correlations are similarly associated with reaction times, whether subjects are performing two tasks simultaneously or attending two locations simultaneously. Finally, it's important to note that our, our tasks, which were designed specifically to probe different types of, of, divided, of selective and divided attention and other cognitive functions, are associated with different mood-related symptom constructs. So using the de depression, anxiety, and stress scales, which are known as the DAS, we observe that performance on different tasks is associated with mood reported on different subscales. This suggests that concentration difficulties may be a more nuanced symptom domain than previously appreciated, and that it's worth parsing these and other subfunctions to better understand cognitive impairments transdiagnostically. Okay, a detailed summary of what I've told you about can be found here for reference. Um, and our main takeaways are that concentration difficulties are not a unitary construct and may be parsed into specific impairments on subtypes of goal-directed attention, and that using tools to parse top-down from bottom-up attention um, can help us identify large-scale neural substrates of attention impairments in psychiatric illness. So thank you for your attention. Please feel free to reach out if you have questions or comments. I'd like to thank my lab mates, thesis committee, collaborators, funding sources, as well as the SOVP organizers who made this virtual talk possible. Thank you.